I would like to also open it out to the uh, audience for questions. Um, as somebody pointed out at the back, I, it'll be important for me to repeat your questions so they can be picked up for the, for the live stream. Um, so I'll start off by introducing myself and I'll ask my panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Susan Forrest and I'm a writer of uh, science fiction and fantasy, obviously. I have uh, about maybe 25 short stories out. I'm really excited because I do have a fantasy novel coming out this summer called Bursts of Fire, so everybody can be looking for that. Uh, I also edit and I also teach. And I think uh, that's plenty. So could I turn it over to my, maybe start with Kate and work our way down? Hi, everyone. Sorry, do I have um, It must have been in the hallway. <laughs> uh, I'm Kate Hardfield. I'm a writer from Ottawa, Canada, uh, and I write uh, a lot of things in historical settings. Um, the two things that I have this year on the Nebula Ballot are uh, both historical. Uh, Alice Payne Arrives is a time travel novella, and um, the game uh, The Road to Canterbury is set, as you might expect, in Chaucer's England. Uh, and I also have a historical fantasy novel out, so I seem to go to the past uh, quite a bit in my speculative fiction. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Marianne Moenraj. Uh, I'm, I also have a fair bit of historical work I draw on. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably most known in the field. I founded Strange Horizons, and I run the Speculative Literature Foundation, which gives grants to writers. But uh, in terms of my writing, uh, I write for Wild Cards, um, which is George R. R. Martin's superhero series, uh, which is hopefully coming to Hulu soon. And my character is, it's set at various time periods, and she, in Low Chicago, the last book, um, went back in time to Chicago at the time of the World's Fair. Um, and so that involved a fair bit of research, and it was uh, super fun to do. I have uh, a mainstream novel, Bodies in Motion, which starts in Sri Lanka in the 1940s, and I had to do a, a lot of research for that. I write uh, my science fiction novella, The Stars Change, is set in the future on a Sri Lankan settled planet, but it is inspired by the events of Black July in Sri Lanka in 1983, um, translated. And I'm currently working on a video game um, based on fifth century Sri Lanka called Sigiriya. I'm Connie Willis, and um, I write uh, a lot of time travel novels, including um, Firewatch, um, Blackout and All Clear, set in World War II, and then uh, Doomsday Books, set in the Middle Ages. Um, and usually history enters into my books, whether I'm doing time travel or not. Uh, passage involves the Titanic. and. Um, Bellwether, although it's set in the present, involves the history of fads. I'm fascinated by history, and so every chance I get, I want to put it into my work. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to do a quick check. Can everybody hear? Yes, we're doing fine? Okay, that sounds great. So the, uh, the write-up says, historical and alternate historical settings are not static. How do the thematic concerns of writers in 2019 inform the way they imagine and reimagine stories set in or inspired by Earth's history? So I think uh, I do have a bunch of questions here, but I'm just going to ask my panelists to, to jump in with, with your opening thoughts on, 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 on the topic. Um, how do thematic concerns, your, your, th your concerns as writers, um, how does that inform the way you imagine and reimagine your stories? Uh, I, I can talk about one problem I ran into, so maybe that's illustrative. So for the video game, we're working with 5th century Sri Lanka, and there's a historical record that was kept by monks. Um, so we have some data about Sigiriya, which is this place you can visit in Sri Lanka. It's a kingdom, that a palace that was built on top of a tor. It's about three times as high as Notre Dame, so you can visit and you can climb it. And the king ruled there for 18 years and built pleasure gardens and so on. So when you're writing fiction set in that, set in that era, um, you are dealing with, first of all, there's a lot of mythology and stories that have been told about it already. So um, the people who are familiar with it have a set of preconceived notions um, that you, you know, he's generally seen as a coward. If I want to write him differently, I'm going to be pushing back against um, what people assume about him. 
but also for myself, I write a lot of LGBT fiction, and we're writing a story that is um, probably going to have some queer characters, and thinking through, um, I had a conversation with a, with a Sri Lankan writer friend who's actually on the panel next door right now, um, but he, he was a little worried when I said that I'd be queer characters because he was worried that um, I'd end up writing something that was glorifying Sri Lanka's past, right? Like creating this idyllic vision of ancient Sri Lanka where everything was okay and people were very accepting when in fact there is a lot of um, anti-LGBT um, feeling. And and so it, it was a, we had to kind of talk out how to navigate that, right? How to responsibly put these characters in the story in a way that I think they would have been there um, back then without making it seem glorified, if that makes sense, Does that, right? Um, without making it seem easy either. Like they probably would have encountered a lot of hostility, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a <laughs> helpful way into this at all. Yeah, I think, I think representation is one big answer to that question. Uh, it's not the only one, but it, you know, definitely um, there are stories that have not been told or have not been told enough or have not been told by, um, by some people um, in history, and, and our view of history is always changing. Um, so I, I think that's one aspect that, cr that comes into it is that how, um, you know, for example, right now uh, in medievalism, um, there are a lot of people who are trying to claim um, medieval Europe, uh, you know, um, for political purposes, uh, and and uh, it's not a neutral thing. You know, what happened in history is not a neutral thing in 2019. Uh, so I think that that has to inform our fiction as well. Um, and then also just I think um, just telling the same the same stories but in new voices. I think about books like Wolf Hall, uh, you know, which isn't speculative but as historical fiction. And you know the story of Thomas Cromwell has been told many times. It's a very familiar story. That book doesn't change history, um, but it's speculative in the sense that the the inner life of that character is told in a new way and in a new voice. Um, and so there are always going to be new authors and new voices um, all the time. So I don't think we ever really run out of stories from the past. Yeah, uh, I, one of the hardest things to get right. I mean people talk whenever they're writing historical fiction, they're always talking about getting the details right. And it's essential to get the details right, because if you don't, first of all, you'll get thousands of emails. So, so you don't want that. Um, and, and on a more deep level, you don't want to make mistakes, because you're trying to truly evoke a time in the past, and you want it to be real. And if people spot errors, that kicks them out of the spell that you've been trying to cast, makes them realize that <laughs> Well, you don't know what you're talking about, and you and that they're not really in the Middle Ages, or they're not really in the Blitz, or wherever, and um, and it makes it much more difficult for you to tell your story and and so on. But but far more important than getting the the uh, details right, the physical details, I think, is getting the attitudes of the people right, and trying to get into the heads of the people. The past is a different place, and people did not believe the same things at any given point. And um, we tend to, I have very strong opinions about what changes and doesn't change in history, but, and everybody has their own set of different opinions about that. But w you have to figure out the things that change and don't change, and then you have to work from that. If people, in fact, were completely different from us, in medieval England, then there's no point in telling their stories. There are no points of connection. There's no comparison between us and them. Um, on the other hand, you can't have them having modern <laughs> attitudes. The, it doesn't matter if you get the clothes right, and the shoes right, and the horses right, and the saddles right, if you screw up the people. And their attitudes were very, very different. And you also can't treat them, their attitudes, with contempt. You can't say, well, the morons back then believed this and this and this. If you come in it with that attitude, you'll never capture what you want to. They, they took their beliefs deadly seriously, we take, just like we take our beliefs deadly seriously. And it's something that we have to, you have to somehow figure out a way to get inside the heads of, of the people. And it's, um, if you err too much on the side, I read a wonderful book 
uh, by A.B. Guthrie, not a science fiction novel, but he wrote a series of Western novels, and the first one was about a trapper called The Big Sky, a uh, trapper in the like 1810s to 1840s, the early, early days of, of uh, exploration in the Western United States by Europeans. And he, I'm sure he is absolutely dead on accurate. I trust A.B. Guthrie completely, but there's, I hate his characters. I hate them. They're, they're way too brutal for us. Their way, their attitudes are simply, I can't fit my head around them. I know it's probably true, but there's just no, it's like, why am I reading about these awful people, these awful people? And yet, that's one extreme. The other extreme is, I think it's too long ago now, but horrible, like, TV miniseries that they used to have in the 70s about, there was one on the Civil War and there was another one on the West. Or Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, for instance, where everybody has these super modern, <laughs> enlightened attitudes, but old-fashioned clothes and old-fashioned horses. And that's one awful end, and the other end is here. And striking that balance, I think, is one of the hardest things that you deal with when you're trying to re write anything said in the past. So you know what question I'm going to ask. <laughs> so how, right? Because I think you're absolutely right. I think um, uh, that, that you've, you've nailed, actually, one of the questions that I had on, on my piece of paper here is that you have people with modern attitudes that have a great deal of difficulty getting into a mindset from a different period that could be so very different in terms of uh, racism, sexism, and you know all the other isms, right? So how do you then take that reader by the hand and bring them into, into an understanding of those attitudes um, in a way then that we can examine the, um, that milieu and those events and access them. You know, I, I might warn us all to be a little careful. I think there's often a tendency to think of it as a progression and like from less enlightened to more enlightened. So just. Amen. You know, we have to be careful yes. about that, right? Yes. That, uh, you know, you think about, if I think about my great grandmother in a fishing community in Sri Lanka, like, you know, she had to deal with a lot of sexism and c constraints on her life in some ways, but. Let's say that are all the men in the village are like out on the boats for 14 hours a day. Well, the women are going to have their own society essentially with a lot of power and in some ways maybe more power than you might see in you know the Oak Park suburb where I live right now among some of the stay-at-home moms and like the things that they're dealing with, right? Um, and the the tensions that they're dealing with around you know like if in you're in a community where the women manage the money, that changes things. And there were a lot of communities like that and, and still are. So. Um, so I think when you start writing this work, one one thing to do almost before you do anything else is try and shed preconceptions about what it was like then, right? Um, and that's hard, but yeah. so but but even consciously being aware of that helps, I think, right? So yeah, I was I was just going to add that the very much the we have our own sets of of prejudices and our own sets of. Um, conceptions that are totally wrong and the and we need to get rid of those if we want to approach history too and I, I remember when I was writing Doomsday Book one of the things I kept reading was well these people they were you know they were ignorant and superstitious and they they suffered death all the time even before the Black Death arrived they faced death on a daily basis babies died things happened so therefore they didn't care anything about their children and I'm like, you know, wrong, so wrong. And yet the contemporary accounts show just the opposite, and they show just how shattering these events were to people because they did care exactly the way we care about our children, they cared about their children. So we make these assumptions. We also make, and I, the, one, the biggest one that I keep finding over and over in every period of history, if you can't read, you are dumb. Illiterate means ignorant mm -hmm. to many, many historians more than it should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it, they're not equivalent at all. There are many preliterate and illiterate societies. And it has nothing to do with the IQ of the people. But that's an assumption that we tend to make because, it's, because reading is such an essential skill for our society. So, and, and like you were saying about the, you know, the grandmother and stuff, you know, my grandmother could outdo me at 
you know, shelling peas and uh, canning fruit and doing all kinds of, uh, put, taking apart a chicken, which I have never mastered, and things. I can do many, many things that she can't, and young people can do many, many, many things that I can't. But each person has the skills they need for their society. So I think the first thing we need to get rid of is our sort of obnoxious sense of superiority. I, I always call it tempocentrism, you know? <laughs> this, we, we feel superior because we, of course, know more. And I'm like, okay, let's take America right now and let's introduce the plague and let's have it move so fast like it moved in Europe that it overwhelms the hospital systems within two weeks. Now, how are we going to do as compared to how they did? And I have a sinking feeling it's not any better <laughs> and maybe worse. So it's real easy to, to judge. So I think keeping that judgment is, I'm not saying we can't think that things are wrong because obviously things are wrong. Some things are wrong. But we have to, when we're approaching history, I think we really have to be careful of our bringing our own prejudices to it too. Yeah, I, I <coughs> am in complete agreement. And um, that stripping away, I think, of what we've been taught um, you know, in a, in a very deliberate and conscious way, um, I think is always the first step of the how for me. Um, you know, I, my novel, Armed in Her Fashion, is about um, women in Flanders. And one of the central plot points of the novel is that the rights that widows had in the early 14th century in Flanders were different than the rights that widows had in France at the same time, um, which is a lot more complex than this, this sort of narrative we have that women had no rights and then they got lots of rights, uh, which is not at all how it happened in different places and different times. There were right. different laws for different reasons. Um, so I was able to write a very deliberately feminist book about the 14th century, but I was very careful to make sure that all of the women's rights in that book were... Um, based on contemporary sources and contemporary laws. And um, I, I'll always return to primary sources um, just so that I can, if someone comes to me and says, well, you have a trans person in this book, I can say, well, here's the example that I actually took this from history, <laughs> you know? And I, I base my characters on, on real people quite a bit or on amalgams of real people. And that way I think I can, I can do that job of trying to look at all of the stories in a given society without kind of just imposing the way that their mm -hmm. stories would be today. Uh, it's not easy, but I think going back to the contemporary accounts is always best. It's, and it's so much fun. I mean, that's, right. you know, we love it, right? So right. I think, you this know. This is all we're lying. The whole <laughs> point is we get to lay on the couch and read books. And <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I mean, I might add, you know, when you think about the, I think it's really easy when you start doing this to sort of focus on tech levels, right? Which is, a, a, I mean, something you have to pay attention to, but thinking about like, okay, did they have railroads? What kind of medicine did they have? Like, you know, what, what did they have access to in terms of tech? But I think part of it is also being aware that different cultures value different things. So, so for an example, my mom got married at 18 and had me at 19 in Sri Lanka and didn't go to college. She had two more kids, was a stay-at-home mom um, when we moved here. And, and, you know, at some point thought about it but didn't follow up. But she was fluent in three languages because that was standard for her community at the time. You were fluent in English and Tamil and Sinhalese. Um, and she and I struggle for fluency <laughs> in, um, in high school in, in just one other language. And, she, um, and they taught math faster in Sri Lanka, right? And so um, she had calculus at 15 or 16. And when I was flunking calculus freshman year and calling her, she was looking at my textbooks and just bewildered that I was having trouble with it. Like, didn't understand how I could be having trouble with it because nobody back in the village school had any difficulty with this, right? It was such a, a default. And so that, I mean, that's a very tiny example. It's contemporary, essentially. It's almost not history, but it's, um, but I think it's a, a useful, like, you have to look at what they had 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, but then also think about place at this. I guess that's what I'm going to choose, thinking about place at the same time. Um, and then think about other aspects rather than tech. There's a, there's a great concept of the cultural iceberg. If you Google, you'll find a bunch of images. And people disagree about like what to put where. But the, the general idea is so you've got this massive iceberg, but the water line is here. The stuff here is what's visible. This is what everyone you can see. You can see how short are the skirts on the women. You can see. Um, what songs do the children do? 
on the playground, right? Those are all these elements of culture that, that are evident. And then there's all this stuff under the surface that um, many of us don't, like we don't think about consciously. It's so embedded that um, it just doesn't, it just doesn't come to the surface at all, right? And so if I tell my students that in Berkeley you can be naked in class, they have an ordinance that says you don't have to wear clothes, okay. and it's the middle, and there was apparently one famous guy who went naked for four years um, <laughs> to all of his classes and carried a towel with him. He um, his pen. <laughs> He had a backpack, oh, back, okay. backpack, you know, backpack, backpack, backpack and a yeah. towel. Always, Still you know, keep your towel, right? Yeah. So it's important. But, um, but uh, you know, and then then I ask the student. I I, I teach at um, college English, and I ask them, you know, like so. It's a hot day. Girls, would you take off your shirt? And and they, there's like this moment of like where they realize they wouldn't but they can't tell me why, right? Like, they don't really have a good reason for it, and they know that, and it's this, but they've also never thought about it, right? And, you know, we talk about yoga pants, right? Which, like, one of my students was not allowed to wear yoga pants at Home Depot, right? And why or why not, right? She's like, it's so much more comfortable than jeans, but it's not allowed, right? And those really fine distinctions um, that are often generational. So, okay, now I'm babbling, but, um, but I, like, I think what's tricky about this is how fine the distinctions are, really, right? Like, you start with the obvious things, and then you get into the fine-grained detail. Mm -hmm. um, and that's often what strikes readers as wrong, because they've absorbed cultural tropes. Like, this is what the Victorians were like. They were, like, buttoned up about sex, and in fact, they were super smutty. Um, right? You go read Victorian smut, and it's, it's really racy and much more explicit and transgressive than a lot of contemporary stuff. So. You know, so, so part of it, I think, of doing it well is getting past your own preconceptions, but then also writing it convincingly enough that the reader is willing to believe you know better than they do, um, which I think is really hard. But that is that is tricky. And I, yeah. my daughter works in a as a criminalist in a crime lab in San Jose, and uh, and people always ask her if if it's like CSI. And she always says, yes, it's exactly like CSI. <laughs> Just like high school is like high school musical. <laughs> <laughs> and I think much of our ideas of the past are high school musical or CSI. They are sort of romanticized or they, they get everything wrong. Every time I'm old enough now that I lived through the 60s, and so I see all these ridiculous things about the 60s. I'm like, that is not what it was like. Not at all. You're getting it totally, totally wrong. And they're getting the, the surface details not too bad. Some of those they're getting wrong also. <laughs> but they are just not, it, that isn't what it was like. And it, that is the really hard part. I, and I don't know how you, you know, you can't, in, when we go any farther into the past than about 100 years, then obviously we're all, n nobody's been there, and we have to, you know, all rely on, on hearsay and what people have written about. But I think one of the things that you can do is you can put down that telling detail, the detail that really seems to, it's, it's all a trick. I mean, writing, I hate to tell people this, but writing is all tricks. It's all tricks. And somebody said, after I taught a class on Shakespeare, they, they were like, well, I always thought he was a great writer, but it's all tricks. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, it's all tricks. Every writer's thing is all tricks. And one of the tricks is that you present one or two details that are so good that you convince them that you know all the details. You know absolutely everything about this period. And that, I think, is one of the hardest things. And one of, one of the best ways, though, I think, is to show um, so you thought this, but you were wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a way to say, you know, it really wasn't like this. You would think that. I just read a great book uh, that's being republished called uh, The House Opposite. It's a, not science fiction, but uh, written during the Blitz. And the woman lived through the Blitz writing it. So she's, she has, I was so jealous because she didn't have to worry about anachronisms at all because she was writing it at the time, you know. <laughs> But one of the things that she put in it was, which was very counterintuitive, was that everybody was consumed with fears, but not about getting blown up. 
They were consumed with fears that their lover and they would be caught. <laughs> and if they died, in a, if they were together, you know, and they were blown up, then what would everyone say? Or they were consumed with uh, somebody had said something mean to them while they were serving on the, the um, air, word, air raid patrol thing, and somebody said a slighting remark, and they're nursing this in their bosom, and they're really, you know, it's like, and her point being, and she should know because she lived through it, that you would think that people would be worrying about being blown up at any second, but in fact, they worry about exactly the same things they always worry about. And the being blown up is just sort of a sideline that's going on out here somewhere. Uh, and so that convinced me more than anything else that she knew what she was talking about. Um, because even, and I, even people who write about a period that they have actually lived in doesn't mean that they get it right. <laughs> people frequently get that wrong. But she, she convinced me that she was very observant and that she had noticed these telling details. Because I think it shocked her and surprised her that she herself was more worried about her personal life you know, and what this was going to do to her hat than, than what it was going to do to her body. <laughs> and, um, and as a result, she wrote it down and then was able to pull me along with her as a reader. I don't. That's not a very good explanation. No, 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 no actually, was, I, think, I think you and Marianne have kind of both kind of answered that question around <coughs> how, how, do you, how do you bring the reader into those other attitudes and understandings. And what I've heard the two of you say, and I think, Kate, maybe you said something a little earlier that fits this, that if, if you can find those details that you can nail and get so convincing that then your reader will follow you. I mean, you know, I would say that's just... It, it connects to a general writing principle too, right? Like, um, like my my beginner writers stu writing students, they want they want to write about love and they want it to be universal and they want the readers to to get how incredibly important love is. Um, and they're all twenty and in love for the first time, right? And so so they write about it in big generalities, whether it's right. fiction or poetry. It's like big right. big generalities, right. and they're afraid of specifics because they they think the reader won't empathize with it. And so we have to really go through that it is those specific details that make it real, and that once you do that, the reader will feel it with you. And right? they'll feel the universal because you were specific. Because you were specific. Right? If I tell you that my husband's eyes, has, his eyes crinkle like right here when he smiles, and I love it, I've loved it from the first day I met him, and he hates it, he, I think he, I don't know, he doesn't like it, and um, I don't care. It's like, it is, like, I see it, and like, I don't know. And like, that's a, that I have no, no like, coherent anything about it, but it, gives you a little bit of the feeling, right? That that uh, complicated feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's always, I mean, speaking of tricks, you know, one of the great things about writing historical settings is that the, the real stuff that happened is weirder than anything oh. I could ever invent. And it, it allows me to put all this cool stuff into my books that makes it look like I have an imagination. But it's, you know, I have a book coming out next year uh, set in early 18th century London in which the women some of the women are wearing eyebrows made out of mouse fur because that was a, a fashion at the time. And I would never in a million years have come up with a world in which women wore mouse fur eyebrows, right? right? But So, uh, so we know. know it has to be true. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The weirder something is in a book, the more likely it is to be real. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's very um, true. I'm just going to throw in uh, one, one more question, and then I'll, I'll be opening it out uh, for people in the audience. Um, but I I the, the description here talks about um, how do you, how, how does the 2019 inform the way that you um, reimagine your stories? And I'd like to drill into that just a little bit more deeply. Do you come up with um, a theme or an observation or something that you want to communicate from, from today's era and then choose a milieu through which you'd like to explore that more deeply? Or do you, or do you find Wow, I was just absolutely fascinated with a certain period of history, and I see resonances, and I think I can reinterpret that story for a modern audience. Like, do you have a particular direction that you go in 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 your inspiration? Um, I think for me, it's um, it's hard to to say where something starts and which direction it heads in because often you have two or three things colliding at the same time, and so I'll I'll read about something. I find interesting, and, and I'll kind of tuck that away as, oh, I'd like to write about that someday, but I don't really have anything yet to go on with it. And then some other part of my brain will be occupied um, with some 
thematic question or philosophical question or character or something like that. And then at some point, you know, three or four things will come together and I'll think, oh, if I made so-and-so do this, and, and then I start to get an idea that way. Um, so it, it, it seems to me almost more of a, a, like a cauldron where a bunch of things are getting thrown in and then eventually you end up with, you know, stew or something more interesting. <laughs> Um, so when I was writing Bodies in Motion, I was in grad school, and I, I came into my advisor at one point and kind of flopped myself on her couch and wailed that, you know, I, I was writing these stories, and they were all the same, and I was in a total rut. I was just writing the same mother-daughter stuff over and over again. And she's like, it's not a rut, it's your tropes. Um, and I was very excited. I had tropes. So, like, that was good, right? And so that, that turned it around. But I think, you know, whether it's... Um, you know, so when I started writing the stories, I was interested in how do the girls who are rebellious teenagers um, turn into the mothers who are trying to keep their daughters safe and controlling them, turn into the grandmothers who couldn't give a damn about any of society's rules, right? Like, and, um, and, and so that's part of why I approached it historically, so that I could, you know, see that at different stages. Um, but all of that was my concern, right? Like, I mean, you were bringing your own obsessions and concerns, whether you're writing historical fiction or futurist stuff, I think that it's all as a, as a means of giving you, there's, a, there's this idea of cognitive estrangement that one of the things science fiction does really well is cognitive estrangement. It lets us talk about our current issues um, through a different lens. That lets you kind of drop your preconceptions, the reader's preconceptions to see it more clearly, right? Because in our everyday life, we're, we're carrying around all our biases and all of our assumptions, right? Um, so, you know, I was super upset about the Syrian refugee crisis a couple of years ago. I wrote a story about refugees in space whales, and um, it's on light speed, I think. And, um, you know, it was, it was a translation that let me get at the issues and maybe reach readers who had already made up their minds not to worry about the Syrian refugees. Right um, on some level, but they could maybe empathize here, and so I guess whether we go—I don't know—I don't know if this is part of why you do it or not. Like, but um, I'm not a heavy researcher. Like, I don't actually enjoy the process. I get impatient. Um, I tend to research kind of like as much as I need to, um, and uh, I get, yeah. And so, so for me it actually always kind of starts with the issues that I want to talk about and then figuring out if I go backwards or forwards, will that give me a way to talk about it that's going to be more effective than, because I also write contemporary fiction, right? Mm -hmm. So. I think, I think the writer is the last person you should ask <laughs> about what they're doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it because they have no idea. Um, I, uh, we, we come, Come, we make up a whole bunch of stuff about why we're doing stuff and where the stories came from and how they all evolved. And this is all, I, I, <laughs> I have a feeling we're just kidding ourselves. Um, every book I have ever written involves rescue. I certainly never sat down to write books about rescue or said, this is going to be a book about rescue or I am interested in exploring rescue here or I see rescue as an issue that is something that we should be thinking about today, but it shows up. Your, your subconscious has its own little um, tricks and its own, its own agenda when it's writing. And I think that especially with history, I think how that shows up for me is in the parts of history I'm interested in. I'm not interested in all history. There are whole swaths of history I could care less about. But there are others that set these sort of, you know, nerves tingling. Uh, the Titanic is one of those. It's mine. I knew the instant I read um, A Night to Remember when I was 14 that the Titanic meant something and that I should write about it and that I didn't know what it meant and I didn't know why I cared about it as opposed to any of a thousand other shipwrecks or any of a thousand other disasters, but the Titanic had something for me. And I think history speaks to us and the way, the relevance it has is that it speaks all the time to us in different circumstances. I've been reading about Oliver Cromwell. No, I am not writing a book about Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> Don't, I would never write a book about Oliver Cromwell. But, but I've been thinking about Trump a lot and then, and then just Oliver Cromwell sort of sprang to mind, <laughs> especially the part where 
after he, he died, you know, of malaria, and they buried in, him in Westminster Abbey with all due honor and pomp and circumstance. And then two years later, when the Commonwealth was over, they dug him up. And they hanged him, drew and quarter him, and stuck his head on a pike for 20 years. And this thought gave me great comfort. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what the parallel is there. I'm just saying. But I do think, I think that history is full of lessons and full of, of resonances and full of things that we're attracted to. But I don't think we always need to articulate that, I, I, even when we're writing. I mean, I will, when I set out to write a book about the plague, I didn't necessarily know why it was the plague I was so attracted to, just that it was, I had always been drawn to end of the world stories and um, the plague was definitely the closest we ever came to having the end of the world and was the end of the world for so many, many people. And so, you know, it spoke to me. But, but as you write, that's the other thing I think you have to do is let the, the work, I'm not a touchy-feely, my characters just got away from me, my plot just got away from me, it all just came to me. That's, <laughs> I, no, absolutely not. But I do think that th the subconscious does have its own agenda and you should allow the subconscious to be working too because it makes it, a, I think, a lot richer when you write. Okay, thank you very much. Um, why don't we open it out to questions from the audience? I see a fellow right here. Oh, my ladies. Okay. We, we have a request from the okay. audience for Connie to tell a story <laughs> okay. about researching black adder. Okay, so I was at the Imperial War Museum uh, doing because they had a special thing on the Blitz, and I said to my husband, "Go away, and let me take notes. I'm going to do. I'll see you at lunch. You go look at bombs and things." And so he went off, and about ten minutes later, he came back and said, "You need to come with me right away. I have something to show you." And I'm like, "I do not want to go. I told you I'm working. Leave me alone." And it, no, this is really good. You're really going to love this. Come on. And I'm thinking very harsh, very harsh thoughts of my husband at this point. And he drags me off, and it is a free day at the uh, museum. He has found this out for people who worked during the Blitz. Mm -hmm. And so he has found this little group of elderly ladies in their little hats and their gloves who have come down for the day, and he has bought them all tea and cookies <laughs> and sat them down so that I can interview them way better than the Blitz exhibit, <laughs> way better. But what was so amazing about it, and I think this is what you're referring to, they just, I, I asked maybe like one question and then they just went, you know, and, and I just wrote as fast as I could. Um, but what was, they told all these hilarious stories and they laughed and they giggled, remember that? Do you remember that? Oh my God, oh my God, et cetera. And I was like, you guys, you're making the Blitz sound like it was really fun, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And they had all been, you know, like ambulance drivers and rescue workers and, and stuff. And uh, the women said, you know, it was. We were young. We were in London on our own for the first time. And there were all these men. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, I have to rethink whole vast sections of my book. Because <laughs> this had not occurred to me. All I could see from the distance was the fear and the, the terrible things happening and the fact that you'd say goodnight to someone, you know, the night before and then never see them again, you know, or you'd turn a corner. And, and, and the fact that you were five minutes ahead of your friend meant that you lived and they died. All these awful things, and I couldn't get that out of my head. And the fact that, yeah, they were young and they were in London and it was really fun and there were all these men. And it, that was such a revelation to me. The facts they told me were really cool. And I used a lot of them in the book. But it was more this... Living through something isn't necessarily the way we think it's going to be. And people, people are very, they manage to be happy under the most bizarre of circumstances. And circumstances where you would not believe that they could be happy. And then they manage to be miserable under the most bizarre of circumstances when you would assume that they had everything and no reason to be unhappy at all. So that I added then that to my list of things I know about history that I need to put in my books. So was that it? Was that the story you wanted? Okay. I know. 
Well, my husband, he is still working off those husband points. I mean, he is, he is in good with me for years and years and years for doing that. So, yeah, it was just, it was wonderful. And it was a, just a great opportunity. And you would, looking at them, you would think they were a bunch of, you know, refugees from a church or something. You know, you wouldn't think, oh, my God, these women dug pieces of bodies out of the rubble and, you know, and watch their friends die and watch their boyfriends in the RAF get killed and, and did all these amazing things and came through and happy and well and sane. And that was a good lesson too, I thought. So. Uh, do we have other questions from the audience? Yes. So the question is, do you look at your primary sources differently when you're writing a fiction book than you would if you're writing a nonfiction book? Or differently than a historian would. Differently than a historian would, OK. Um, I think one aspect of it for me is that um, I let myself skip over things right. that I know that will we're not. We're just looking for the good <laughs> stuff. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, if I were reading, you know, for example, right now I'm researching fifth century Europe um, and uh, the transformation of the, the Roman Empire at that time. And um, there are a lot of times I'll hit a chapter in a book and I'll realize, okay, this is dealing with a part of history that I'm just not going to write about. So, you know, if I were a historian, presumably I wouldn't be allowed to just skip bits. <laughs> but, you know, I do, if I, ha if I get a sense that it's not really relevant to my interests, then I can just keep going that way. Um, so I'm, I am kind of looking for particular things, um, but leaving a little bit of space for serendipity, for sure. Um, so when I was working on that book, I... Uh, realized I didn't know enough about Sri Lankan history, and so I was lucky enough I was able to do an independent study um, in grad school. I had a professor who gave me, who like designed a course, and met with me every week, and I read a, another history book, and we started with like prehistory and came forward. Right, um, one of the essays uh, he had me read was by Stephen Kemper. It was called The Presence in a book called The Presence of the Past, and it was looking at the Mahavamsa is the historical record in Sri Lanka, and it's like 2,000 years of written record, right? Which is amazing to have access to that. But the essay was talking about how um, contemporary readers tend to treat it as fact, and, um, and it's also a religious document, and so it's very wrapped up in um, religious ideas of nationalism and who belongs in that country, et cetera. And it was in fact written by monks who fought for power. And so one group of monks would be in power and then another would come to power and they rewrote it. And it was rewritten over and over and over again, right? So what we, we don't have all those earlier versions. We have the many times rewritten version. And um, so that awareness, I think, uh, it makes me suspicious of you know, if you can't talk to the individuals who live through it, anything written down, I, I actually am really suspicious of it because you're always thinking about well, what are the biases that people bring, even unconsciously, sometimes consciously, but like when they write down their version of events, right, we know how fickle human memory is, right? Like you think you saw something, but you didn't, right? You, what you write down is what made sense to your brain in that moment, right? Um, so I, I think as a fiction writer, you can use the record as a jumping off point, mm -hmm. find some good details, and, and then tell the story you want to tell. Um, I do also write nonfiction. And when you're writing nonfiction, I think a lot of it is, um, I've, been, I've been trying to write some pieces about the Sri Lankan history to give people context for the Easter bombings. And, um, and so there, it, it just ends up incredibly nuanced. You, you, you are, it's this balancing act between I want to give people um, all the nuance and complexity so they um, don't go away with the wrong impression, but I also want to give them a clear enough through line that if they're not familiar with this at all, 
they can follow the course of events. And that is, a, I think, a really tough balancing act. So the people who do this professionally, I have like a lot of, yeah. you know, like, um, like I'm even thinking of in biography, like Julie Phillips' biography of Tip Tree. I was super impressed by that book because I felt like it managed to both give you the through line and preserve nuance, which is just so. I'm I'm so glad that she's doing the Le Guin biography. So. Okay, so so William the Conqueror's son Rufus um, went hunting in the New Forest with his buddies, his brother, his younger brother, and his uh, and his best friend, and uh, hit and then Rufus's best friend, and a bunch of other guys, uh, including a couple of people who worked for church officials, and something went wrong, and <laughs> Rufus got himself shot with an arrow and left for dead in the forest. And it's like, it's an Agatha Christie. I mean, there's so many suspects that you just can't, everybody hated this guy. And uh, they just left him lying there. His brother, his younger brother, went shooting off to Winchester to secure the church funds and to declare himself king. He got himself crowned like within moments of this happening. Um, the, the best friend, supposedly Rufus's best friend, took off had a gallop for France and stayed there until it was safe to come home where he inherited, oddly enough, huge estates and lots and lots of money um, and then from the new king. And then, uh, there were, and then the church officials had somehow been officially notified before the murder actually took place. <laughs> and so, so, so I'm reading all this and I'm thinking, I think I know what happened here. <laughs> I think Rufus was just a piece of garbage and nobody cared that he died. And everybody was anxious to get rid of him, and he was just, you know, there were too many suspects. So then I read this thing. Well, you know, the church leaders were very biased against Rufus because he was not a good Christian. And so they obviously wrote this very biased, you know, uh, account. And they claimed that he had gone straight to the devil and that when he was buried in Winchester, the tower promptly co collapsed on top of him as a sign from God's, of God's disapproval and stuff. Now, there's all kinds of junk to get through there. But to me, the through line is they left him lying in the forest. <laughs> and this has to be accounted for, you know, somehow. How is this accounted for? That isn't what, and the peasants ended up finding his body a couple days later and dragging it off to Winchester for them, which usually would get them, you know, nailed with the murder, right? And, and because it's really great to have a scapegoat show up. But nobody did, which I'm like, oh, they must have really hated him because they weren't even going to hang a couple peasants, you know, in order to, to come up with a, a reasonable excuse for this murder. So although there's a lot of junk and there's a lot of bias and there's a lot of versions and you're certainly not getting the straight facts, with history, a lot of the time you can figure it out, you know. And I think, I think what historians tend to do is they look at, they're like, you know, that old show, Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. And I think they, they tend to focus so on the facts that sometimes the bigger picture <laughs> escapes them. And, and there, I couldn't get any of the historians I was reading, none of them were committing to how they thought this had happened or what they thought had happened. And I'm like, well, I think I know what happened. <laughs> and if Poirot were here, we'd really know what happened. <laughs> And so, you know, I think that that's a difference in approach for fiction writers. They're always looking for the story that's underneath the facts and what the story means. And they may have to delve through all kinds of, you know, lying witnesses or, mm -hmm. or uh, people who had biases or whatever. But, but the, it's amazing how often the truth does emerge from history. It isn't true that history is written by the winners. And it isn't true that the farther we get away from the event, the less we know. The reverse is true. Once nobody has a stake in it, the truth can come out. And we know a ton more about uh, the Wars of the Roses, for instance, um, than we did at the time. And, and that, t I mean, we know that Anastasia didn't survive. I mean, we learn new stuff all the time, historical stuff. So, but I think with writers, the focus, our focus, no matter how much we care about the rest of it, is always on the story, don't you think? Yeah, it just I've been thinking, you know, as you're talking, it makes me think of um, Josephine Tay's book, Daughter of Time. Oh, God. You know, oh, right? Great book. Yeah. Such a great and, book. Don't uh, get you know, wrong, but great book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what I was just going to say. It's, you know, it's a mystery novel um, about Richard II, and I enjoy it 
immensely as that thing because it is it's unusual and it's it's an interesting book um, and it you know it has its flaws but uh, it's it's an interesting mystery novel. Um, I don't want to read that book to learn about Richard II. It doesn't. I, I'd rather read a, a history book for right. that. Right. So I, I think like there, that's an example. But a history book can't do what that book is trying to do, which is trying to say, you know, I think that fellow had kind of a nice face actually, <laughs> and <laughs> you know. So they're, they're trying to do two, two different things. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I mentioned the story I wrote with someone time traveling back to the World's Fair. So I wrote that in part because. Um, because I had read Devil in the White City, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? Which is an amazing, um, very compelling, it's like, you know, when you ask people what's their favorite Chicago book, it's usually in the top five, right? Um, and it's a compelling story because that juxtaposes the World's Fair um, with H.H. H. Holmes, who was this guy who built a murder castle, and a serial killer who murdered a lot of people in very creative ways. The guy who wrote that book did a lot of research, right? So he has his annotations, journalistic, et cetera, stuff. Um, if you read the reviews, people are somewhat critical of it. There are a bunch of people who will say, well, you know, like, I don't know that this was proved and this was proved and whatever. Um, but I think for most people, that doesn't matter because what they love about it is, uh, is that he tells a very compelling story. Mm -hmm. And you fall into that world and you're immersed in it. It's very believable. It's plausible, um, and it even if it's not absolutely factually true in every detail, it reveals truths of the human heart um, that people recognize and resonate mm -hmm. with. Right. So. Right. And I think things. I, I'm not a big. Well, I'm going to take what feels true as opposed to facts. I'm a huge believer in fact. Huge. But um, that I was reading recently about Elizabeth the first when she was put in the tower by her sister. Um, they brought her in through Traitor's Gate, where her her mother, Anne Boleyn, had come into the tower. And, and of course, uh, Elizabeth's 17 years old, and she knows exactly what happened to her mother when she went through Traitor's Gate. So instead of going into to the tower, she just sat down on the steps in a pouring rain and refused to go any farther. Mm -hmm. And she just sat there and she said, I'll sit here till doomsday, and because she knew what was going to happen to her. and. I read this whole essay and it was saying, well, we don't think it was really Traitor's Gate. It's unlikely that she was brought in through Traitor's Gate because really, da 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 da. And it's unlikely that this, and at the time there would have been this and this and this. And so it's more likely that she was brought in this other way. And I'm like, shut up, shut <laughs> up. <laughs> and it's not that I'm dismissive of the facts, but they're missing the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. They're missing this, the truth of the story is, how would you like to be 17 and knowing you're going to be beheaded just like your mother mm -hmm. by a member of your own family? That's the central truth of history, is people and their emotions and the terrible things they do to each other and, and all those, those fact the facts bolster them. And I'm not, you know, I have no idea. This guy wasn't terribly convincing to me. Maybe mm -hmm. they didn't go in through Traitor's Gate. And I certainly would never defend oh, let's just believe legends because they're more fun, <laughs> you know. But at the same point, I just had this sinking feeling that this historian was was blind, that he was not seeing anything of the, the actual history that was there. He was missing it all because he was too focused on the facts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of facts, I think my mouth and brain mixed up Richard II and Richard III, but uh, anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> Jet lag. The one, that's the right. one maybe yeah. did or didn't kill the That's the one, yes. That's the okay. one. YouTube, you yes. got that? She yes. knows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I blame jet lag. Uh, do we have another question? Yes, right here. What was a good piece of nonfiction that you read recently? Of historical nonfiction? His or other. Historical or other nonfiction that uh, inspired you? I just read the journals, the early journals of the Washburn expedition to Yellowstone. We're going to Yellowstone this summer. And, uh, and was horrified to discover that in the early days, after it, after it was a national park, um, and there was a hotel at Mammoth Springs, so like not, you know, super early, and they and they were passing out little guidebooks of, you know, here are the sites of Yellowstone to see. People were still being killed by the Sioux, mm -hmm. 
inside the park. And I'm like, here we're worried about bears. And we, at least we're not worried about being, you know, shot to death with an arrow at some point. So this was a total shock to me. I had not realized that that had intruded that far into the, what we think of the present, you know, the modern day. So yes, I would recommend that. Um, I think it was last summer I read John Lewis's graphic novel, March, Representative John Lewis, um, which was about the fight for voting rights. Yeah. And yes, it yes, is yes. incredibly gripping. It's in a lot of detail. There is a lot of factual information in there, many of the people's names who were part of these various student orgs and so on who were arguing. Um, and it's, I don't know, it, it did an inc a really great job of uh, bringing to life other, otherwise, yeah, like otherwise dry arguments about like, you know, political strategy, right? Um, it, it made it very vivid and I'm working on a, on a project that is, is, I don't know, it's a little bit like Gandhi in space kind of thing, but like trying to argue out like how do you um, get, how do you make a society progress, right? How do you, and so reading that was really helpful in pinning down, well, it really is like local politics, right? It is like you go and you want to have this high-level conversation, but so-and-so over here is really just mad about the stoplight that hasn't been repaired, right? And like, you know, and like, and that's what you have to deal with if you want to get them to come and show up and possibly get beaten up by the cops in a week, right? Um, so and didn't that win the Pulitzer? It seems like it did. I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't track it. I wouldn't be surprised. I thought it was brilliant. I think yeah. you should. I, I, yeah. like, I, after I read it, I want to just like hand out copies to everybody. Yeah. And I think there's a follow-up one coming called Vote. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's one of the most pressing issues of our time. So I, I recommend it to everyone. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, I have a few candidates. I'm reading a book right now called um, Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts. And I'm trying to remember the author's name. Uh, without Googling, but um, uh, yeah, I think it's a unique enough title, they should be able to find it. Uh, and um, it's a gorgeous, huge hardcover book full of pictures of uh, manuscripts. We just got the five minute note. Um, and what interests me about it, uh, well, everything, every page is interesting, but uh, the the story, uh, the stories of manuscripts themselves, I think, not necessarily of their content, but of, of their history as objects, um, is so full of stories um, and, and so full of interesting people who have uh, lived their lives entwined with these books. And so, uh, yeah, I could write a gajillion novels, I think, out of that one. <laughs> and uh, although I'm not a panelist, I'm going to just take a moment to uh, recommend a, a book that I was reading. Uh, it's called One Day in August by John O'Keefe. And um, I, I'm also working right now on a, a, a st historical book set in 1942, The Allied Raid on Dieppe, which was a terrible disaster. 5,000 Canadians were involved, and yep. it, it, it was a terrible disaster. Uh, and it, it takes the thesis that perhaps, and some of the historians I talked to said, no, 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 this is not true. Uh, but perhaps they were looking for a four-rotor Enigma machine there. Oh, so, of course, yeah. that feeds into my book, so I'm going to go with that fact <laughs> or th here, theory. Um, yes, we did get our five-minute warning, so uh, could I just maybe ask our, our panelists to give any uh, you know, very brief um, one- or two-sentence uh, wrap-up of anything that we maybe didn't cover today? past is sometimes specifically relevant, you know, like Cromwell, but it's always relevant. All the past is always relevant. It's what we have. It's our book that we have of how humans act. And so every writer, no matter what they're trying to do, that's, that's our research right there is history. And it's all we have. So we need to study it more. Um. This isn't fiction, but I, I have a cookbook coming out this summer of, of Sri Lankan recipes, and there was a lot of um, food research and food history, and thinking through, um, there's so much knowledge embedded in very, very tiny elements of technique and flavor and so on, right? And so I think it's useful looking at, well, how did this, how did this evolve? How did a thousand cooks over centuries end up deciding like this is the right proportion of lime to salt to you know um, uh, to spice and I think that's it, it always makes me tremendously sad 
when those foodways get lost because you're losing so much depth. And I think, so that's maybe a interesting element of this um, whole conversation is that once you start doing the research and you start going back, the layers get so deep and so built up um, and it is then going to lend a lot of richness to the fiction um, compared to if you are, like when you're world building science fiction, you're uh, like you're making up everything from scratch often and um, you don't, I'm, you can work by analogy, but it's, I, I find it much harder in a lot of ways because I can't lean on the depth of history um, to carry like, ah, you know, the women behave this way because this and this and this and this and this led to the length of skirts being what they are here, right? So. Um, <coughs> yeah, just as briefly as I can, I, I do think that there are, um, you know, we see trends in publishing and often we see them as they're just in the rearview mirror, mirror because no one really knows until it happens. Um, but I do think that there have been some interesting thematic trends when it comes to time travel and and fiction set in the past recently that have a great deal to do with where we are in our current moment. Um, so I think it's a, a, a bigger picture than even just any one of us in our particular books. I think it has to do with what we are all writing about um, as a community as well. Uh, could I have a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>